organization for four years and I've not seen this happen. Um, so, and, and seeking and looking for some older wines is, is hard to find. Um, our cellars aren't very big like some other wine regions, so this is really, really special. And we're really excited to, to share and experience this with you. So, um, I have two guests that are very dear to me. Um, so, we, we have Melissa who's going to be um, taking you through the tasting. She's a sommelier. She recently um, launched a master class. So super geeky people can enjoy their own library. She spent so many hours tasting and inventorying so many thousands of bottles of wines over several decades. So this is a really cool thing that nobody knows about. It just launched a few months ago. So talk to her about that over the week um, today, or day or week, depending on how long you're here. Get to know her better. Um, and Tom Elkier, he's a former wine writer, but he's our resident historian of Anderson Valley. He knows a lot. Um, he wrote the introduction document for um, those that are visiting us for the week. So if you read that, you got to kind of get a little sense of history, place, and where we're at now currently. We'll keep that document on our website going forward. So um, really excited to have him here. He's going to introduce um, Melissa, and um, I guess I just introduced Melissa. He's going to introduce and kind of set the pace for the history of Anderson Valley Wines um, and what we're going to be exploring today. So thank you for being here. Enjoy and enjoy the tasting afterwards. Well, this is a thrill and a half to appear with Melissa. She's not just a track sommelier, she's a master chef, she's an entrepreneur, she's an author, she's a teacher, she's a builder, she's a creator, she's an influencer. Mm -hmm. She's amazing. So uh, I'm going to get out of the way as quickly as possible so you can have as much time with her as you all deserve. The, the point of our part is to help you understand a little bit about Anderson Valley historically, geographically, geologically, and culturally as a context for the ageability of the wines. So the, one of the most basic things to understand is that Anderson Valley is not a valley. It's a watershed that's actually uh, kind of this curling, rolling terrain of microclimates that are cut by hundred creeks and the riparian areas and groves of trees. So there are some places where the watershed widens out a little bit and looks like a valley, but most of the valley, not a valley. That's one issue. So people can dial in their planting, their varieties, and their farming at a high degree of specificity. Unlike, say, Napa, where you can see 50 miles of valley, you can't see that far away. Another thing to understand is that the valley is highly unusual in that it's not between <coughs> the ranges of hills in California, which typically run north-south. It's what's called a transverse valley. It cuts through the coastal range, and this is due to tectonic forces, uh, the same tectonic forces that reversed the direction of the Vallado River, that forced the Russian River uh, out of Napa and out through Sonoma those same forces cut this valley transverse. So that changes the maritime influence because the valley is strongly influenced by the sea. It's a desert valley like a lot of other wine valleys in California, but it's close to the ocean and because of the angle, the wind and moisture create a distinctive growing condition. So we can get as hot as any desert here we could get in last September, Matt, what did we hit? 115? Just for one day. Like around Labor 115? Day? Something like that. Yeah. But we also can have months where the overnight lows are near freezing. Uh, not during the growing season. During the growing season, we can typically have 30 or 40 degree swings between the high and the low. There's constantly cold, moist air moving through, even on hot days. So, those are two things, the, the not a valley, transverse, and then the third thing is we're on the southern border of the northern rainforest in North America, the one that starts way up in Canada and comes down about to here. That's why we have redwood trees. We're also at the northern limit of the California Mediterranean climate, which is drier and warmer going south. So if you think of like Paso, that's the signature tree is an oak tree on a brown hillside. We got those. If you think of Monterey Carmel Valley, the signature trees are redwood trees and, and 
trees that drink from the air, wet trees. We have both. They overlap here. So because of that, we have the advantages of the dry Mediterranean climate and some of the advantages of the wet rainforest type climate. So the diversity that we can support is pretty wonderful. There's been ranching, orcharding for uh, fruits and olives, uh, viticulture, uh, <coughs> cannabis, obviously. Um, but that variety is not matched by quantity because Anderson Valley is not flat enough or close enough to anything for big agriculture. They say that Mendocino County is 98, only 2% of the vineyard, of the land of the county is flat. In Anderson Valley, it might be 3 or 4%, but mostly it goes up. And when you have agricultural zoning, that means the smallest parcel you can buy on the hillside is 160 acres. It's, it's no problem if you're you know, a big corporation, but if you're the sort of person who wants to have a vineyard, vineyard, it's a lot of land to buy, and it's vertical. So that's the terrain that we have. Highly unusual location, geology, and climate. So humans were here for hundreds of years. Indigenous people were here. Uh, European-oriented uh, people with European ancestors arrived after the Civil War, 1850s, a little bit later. There were some economic booms for logging. There was an attempt to build a railroad through the valley, stalled in Yorkville Highlands and never made it to Cloverdale. But those, those booms populated the valley. Enough people were here that knew it was a beautiful place and wanted to stay here. And enough of them were immigrants, people who had come down out of the foothills of the Sierras after the gold rush and silver rush were over, they settled in Sonoma and Mendocino and brought their wine culture with them, Italians, French. So there was some local viticulture on an immigrant basis, but that was mostly for personal consumption. Um, there was, there were scattered attempts at commercial production, but it wasn't really until the back to the land movement got started in the 60s that people from the Bay could come here and start the second chapter of their lives. The road between Boonville and the county seat wasn't paved until 1962. It was a dirt road to get from Anderson Valley to the county seat until the 60s. But once 128 is paved and 253 is paved, people can come to the valley. And now you see people from the Bay coming up, they're bringing their families, and you see um, the pioneers start to arrive in the 60s. Uh, Tony Hush and Ed Meads and Bella Handley and uh, those families that are still here in the 70s. Uh, Ted and Deborah Bennett and Kyle come, it's John Navarro. John Sharpenberger arrives in the 80s and starts Sharpenberger. So uh, the Appalachian status uh, was granted in 1983. Uh, the petition was put together in 82. There were maybe 20 vineyards or so in the Appalachian. The vineyard was nearly 70% white. The top red grape was Zinfandel. 8% Pinot Noir. So remember that number because it's going to flip in a little bit. So uh, the number of residents has hardly changed for 50 years, but the number of people from outside the Appalachian that are making wine from the Appalachian has exploded 500% in the last 25 years. So number of resident wineries haven't really increased <coughs> at all. There's just not that much room for wineries, not that much need for them. We only have, you know, what's it, Courtney, 2,500, 2,700 acres, something like that, under vine, not very much. So 
the, the big turn for this region comes in the 1990s. And a number of things happened all at once, late in, the, in that decade. First of all, the red wine boom is really uh, taken hold. And a country that had been pretty much white wine driven, except for big cities in the coast, now has become a red wine country. Cabernet is now officially king. The silver oak phenomenon has happened. <laughs> Matt's dad and mom had made uh, Napa and red wine famous, and so suddenly people are looking for more red grapes. Uh, a little known anecdote, when Michel Salk came to found Rotor Estate, 1985, he went to the nurseries for Pinot Noir, and they said, we don't have any. And his, he sent this information back to France, and they said, plant a vineyard with some Pinot Noir, even if it's just in front. We have to look like a winery immediately. <laughs> so he found an obscure Swiss clone of Pinot Noir called Later and planted it in front of the vineyard, in front of the winery building that was going up so that it would look like a vineyard, an estate vineyard. The nurseries didn't have Pinot Noir. In the 90s, they did because sparkling wines were consuming a lot of Pinot alongside the Chardonnay. So Pinot Noir is becoming more popular, red wine is becoming more popular. The Dijon clones arrived from France. These were developed in France for Burgundy, which is kind of a cool, moist place. And these new clones were going to be riper, they were going to survive disease better, they were going to get uh, mature in a shorter growing season all things which were perfect for Willamette Valley. And once they got sucked into Willamette Valley, they found their way to Anderson Valley and Russian River Valley. And so those clones very quickly took hold here. And anybody who was planting a new vineyard or replanting had the opportunity finally to get some really great fruit that was going to deliver the terroir that we have here in a way that the previous plant material had not been able to do. GoldenEye arrives. Now this is big money from Napa, where they make big, bold, extracted wines. They found a Pinot Noir-only winery in Anderson Valley. There had not been a Pinot Noir-only winery in Anderson Valley because the history had been so white. The Riesling and Gewürztraminer had been what brought the wine writers, what brought the restaurants. Um, until when I started wine writing around 1990, that was the story. Nobody wrote about Pinot Noir. It was like, oh yeah, they have it, but the Wurzkaminer, Riesling, uh, Chardonnay, Sparkling Wine, that, that was the story that the editors assigned and that you could pitch. Seems kind of strange to me now, but the percentage of those varieties have now traded places with Pinot Noir. And now those are in the 20% and Pinot Noir is more like 65, 70% of the planted acres. So this region that was became famous for white is now a big transformation. Not too many Appalachians can pull that off. So the other big thing that happened in the 90s is um, a few large vineyard properties changed hands. And the new owners were people who had deeper pockets and more ambition. And they pulled out old material and put in the Dijon clones. They brought in modern farming. They uh, had much smarter farmers, more experienced farmers, people like Norman Kobler. And suddenly there was a lot more fruit <clears throat> than the local wineries needed. And these ambitious new growers found ambitious winemakers in Sonoma County, Garagiste's Ted Lemon from Little Rye, uh, Wells Guthrie, who had Cocan at that time, uh, Radio Coteau, Eric Sussman, uh, William Sellium, some of these 
hot, young, ambitious labels, suddenly we're putting Anderson Valley on their labels and designating vineyards, Savoy, Farrington, Wiley. Uh, and this all started right at the turn of the century. The rich were in the late 1990s. So this set the stage for Anderson Valley wine to suddenly become a lot more age-worthy. So we already have the natural growing conditions where acidity is easy. We don't have hang time here very much. A few vineyards, a few vineyards I can think of, maybe three or four, where we weren't picking until October. But most of the time, picking here is pretty early because we could get frost in October. We get rain in September, typically short growing season, so you don't have a lot of hang time, you're not going to have a flabby wine that you have to acidify. The balance naturally is going to be there for you. But now with the Dijon, we've got stuff in, we've got color to go with the acidity. So that's a factor that's kind of new. Um, also, the valley, because it was so isolated and kind of marginally economic, we did not have infrastructure for really sophisticated Um you know, Navarro and a few others have amazingly transformed their facilities over time and become more and more sophisticated, but they started as big barns, a lot of them. So we have more sophisticated infrastructure for, for raising wines up. We have a much larger pool of winemakers because when you have 60 uh, winemakers from outside the Appalachian that are buying the food and making the wine, they come to the events, they pour, we taste, we compare. You have a lot more ideas and a lot more sophistication and a lot more, frankly, competition to make better, more age-worthy wines. That's, and nobody's complaining about that locally, by the way. We love that. We want more people to put Anderson Valley on their wines and make our region better known. Also, in my experience, tannin management, which was kind of random 30 years ago, is much more of a science now. It's not so much a palate art thing. It's possible to actually grow and vinify wine with the intention to make it age with it. This was not common in a place where you know, grew Zinfandel because you could drink the Zinfandel six months after you picked it. That was the legacy here 100 years ago. Now, it's completely different. The big question for me is, are the consumers interested in building Pinot Noir for five years to where it gets really good? I tell everybody they should, but that, and when they ask why, my answer is, wine is sublime, and it's never more sublime when it's showing you its age. That's where the real character and the beauty of the wine come out. And that's what Melissa is going to give us today. How many of you have been to Anderson Valley before? Almost everybody. Anyone first time? A few first times. Doesn't that drive out here insane? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I absolutely am so in love with this valley. Part of me is grateful that it's hidden. The other part of me is bummed because not more people are experiencing this gorgeous, gorgeous valley. Um, I fell in love with this probably close to 20 years ago when I was first coming up here. When I was just a, I was actually a chef at the time. I was even a baby song. Um, just give you a little bit of history about myself before we dive into the tasting. I was a fine dining chef for about 14 years before I got into wine full time. I was the head sommelier for Cano Wine Merchants, which gave me incredible exposure to incredible libraries, all authentic wines. We were importing wine from all over the world and the founder, Clyde Beffa, co-founder, um, really gave us an incredible experience with those. While I was there, we would get a lot of calls for people needing their wine cellars to be organized or inventory for insurance and legal purposes. None of the old guys wanted to do it because it's not easy work, um, so they gave me a chance to do it. I did it, I loved it, I thrived. I started my business in Ocreus while I was there. One of the first things I came up against was um, a huge, it was a big deal divorce. Back then, the collection was worth about a million dollars. Now that's almost small um, for me. I just finished doing one that was $4.9 million in one. Um, 
But I had to argue the valuation of the wine collection for the court, and that turned into me giving the only legal presentation on the valuation of wine collections in the country. And so that's been approved by 15 state bar associations in the U.S., and it's what I spend a lot of time doing is cataloging and appraising historic wine collections and uh, most recently a, a historic winery that's going through transition and working with the Department of Justice with an international bribery scandal involving the U.S. Navy. So <laughs> really interesting, um, interesting career and I am so, so passionate about high quality aged wines because of PL, I was able to taste Bordeaux from the 50s and 60s on a fairly regular basis, um, Madeira from the late 1800s. And what I really love about my clients all over the Bay Area in particular, especially when I'm working with some of the historic uh, wine cellars that were started by historic figures in California, is being able to taste these wines from you know inaugural 1972 vintage um, and other ones. I'm now working with uh, the martinis, so being able to taste the wines from the martinis going back to the 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond is really amazing. So I was so thrilled, and these were incredibly hard to find. Um, older wines, one, because the production levels are very small, two, people are drinking a lot of them. They weren't known to be um, age-worthy because I don't think anyone was really planning on aging Anderson Valley wines. One of the things that I've really gotten into when I'm working with these wine cellars, it doesn't matter if it's people are doing day trips or things like that, whenever they want to liquidate their collections, first thing I do is reach out to the wineries before I start brokering at other places because of fires and other things that have happened. Um, they oftentimes don't have libraries of their wine. So this is really, really special that we are able to get these. I think they're showing really well. We had one kind of faulty bottle of Toulouse, but otherwise I think all the wines are really sound. Super interesting, you know, these are, mm -hmm. and they have great stories. Um, we do have Jim in the room with us, so I'd love to talk about a little bit of the history of Navarro, why we have Alsatian varietals here. I think that that's, I love Alsace. I got to travel to um, Alsace and Loire in France with KNL and really, really fell in love with the more elegant style Pinot Noir and uh, the white varietals as well. So, Jim, if you don't mind talking about the first uh, word. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, when Ted and Deborah bought the property in 1971, um, you know, I think uh, wines from Alsace were uh, very popular, and and also from Germany as well. And so um, some of them had a lot to do with, you know, Riesling and Hirschmeier. Some weren't. I mean, some were just sort of lower terroir that were semi-dry, but but they were nevertheless. Um, those wines were striking a chord with young Americans and. Um, at the time, there wasn't very much Gewurztraminer, as an example, grown in California, and it was actually the highest price rate in California in 1975. So um, that fact, combined with the fact that there was um, there were some studies that were from the 40s and 50s from UC Davis, where they had looked at uh, degree day accumulation uh, around the state. And it had identified Anderson Valley as being one of the coolest uh, potential grape growing districts in California. So, um, so sort of armed with that historical data, you know, they went forth and they planted uh, reverse Streamer, but also Pinot Noir um, and Chardonnay. And um, and it wasn't really until the 90s that we moved into actually growing. Riesling for ourselves and you know, Brie and Muscat and those things. But uh, in those early years in the in the seventies, that's that's really what they what they planted. Uh, there were attempts to grow Cabernet that weren't successful. Um, at at meets, there some of the first plantings were in, in Cabernet. Uh, I think it was just a little too too cool uh, to get those right. Um, and 
you know, I've seen some changes in our harvest dates over the years. You know, Tom had mentioned about, oh yeah, you know, what would come in uh, typically in, you know, in September. But uh, when I first started, we would start harvesting reverse demeanor pretty typically about the third week of uh, and uh, of September. And often, you know, we have a lot of vintages where we didn't start picking in and more until October. and <coughs> didn't finish until almost the 21st of October. Um, and I think all that's changed. So I, I remember uh, often upsetting growers that I wasn't picking some fruit like Cabernet Inland until November. But that, that just doesn't happen anymore. And I, you know, I think that's a lot to do with <coughs> shifting climate, but also with new plantings and uh, clean plant material that are able to, you know, grow and accumulate sugar a little better. Yes, absolutely. And I did want to mention there's, um, you know, Navarro is so iconic in the industry. And a lot of that is thanks to uh, Permit Lynch and Alice Waters, correct? So that's, um, it's, it's super special to find. Most of the sales are direct to consumer, right? And then, um, so whenever you find it on the wine list, it's kind of one of those like hidden gems. And, so. and I'll also mention that um, there is a connection between Alice Waters and Permit Lynch. And Navarro is that Ted and Deborah live in the neighborhood. You know, they were at um, at Chez Denise on opening night, and um, so they were really, you know, part of that whole uh, Berkeley, East Bay, rethinking what, you know, wine could be, what food could be, and, and trying to see that potential. So they were part of those conversations, you know, uh, back in the 70s. So we have a lot to thank them for. Most of us on to Anderson Valley. So this is made in the dry style, similar to what you would find in all sauce. 2012, so an 11 year old boards. One of the only, not very many, are being produced in the West Coast. Um, I think Toulouse does one as well, Hush does one. But I think that this is just gorgeous. Really fun. The aromatics are just awesome. Crushed roast geranium, but beautiful acidity. All of these wines are also going to be fairly low in alcohol too. So as long as they're stored properly, they should age really, really, really well. And so the first thing I teach in my master class on wine collecting is the most important investment you're going to make up front is wine storage. So it's uh, absolutely imperative that you have either a home cellar or a well-made wine refrigerator, I have definite opinions on those, or off-site wine storage that is trustworthy and insured and whatnot. But you can tell that these, all of these came out of the cellar that we're tasting today. And then our second wine, another icon in the industry, the Myers family. Um, if you haven't had a chance to read Bonnie Meyer's book, Perfectly Paired, Perfectly Paired, it is a beautiful book. It's a love story, and it also talks about the history of wine in Napa Valley, and it's just absolutely, I think, one of the best books that I've read in the industry um, from a personal and professional account. And Matt came out here to start, start Meyer's family in what year? Uh, we bought the property in 99, but we really didn't start making wine until 2003. Excellent. And um, I'm sure you know who his father is, founded Silver Oak, their first vintage, 1972. And then in 2002, we're sold to the Donnelly family. Right. Silver Oak. Oh, Dun no, well, those, they were an original partner of the Donnelly family. Got it. Yes, yeah. Donnelly. There you yeah. go. Um, great. Would you like to speak about this? Sure. sure. Yeah, I remember this vintage. Um, <laughs> 2011, you know, it was kind of funny because when Melissa asked um, which vintage of Chardonnay, because we started making Chardonnay from the Donnelly Creek Vineyard in 2009, and I would say, you know, for, for the next decade, the vintages were all pretty consistent. There was a little bit of variation. 2011 stood out like a sore thumb because 
Um, we normally would harvest these grapes a little bit riper. We, we shoot 10 for our Chardonnay. We tend to shoot for like 22 and a half, maybe 23 bricks, um, which results in a wine that's just below 14% alcohol. This is clocking in at 11 and a half percent alcohol um, because we got four inches of rain the day after we harvested. And we didn't think the wine was going to make it through, or the grapes were going to make it through that. And, um, you know, it's, it's not going to be everybody's cup of tea, but I really love it. It's really tight. It's got a ton of acid. It's got low alcohol. And it's just kind of very, 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 much like a lot of 2011s, is very slowly evolved in the bottle um, over time. And, uh, you know, our... The winemaking technique in this uh, in this wine is pretty hands off. It's it's barrel fermented. It's all uh, natural yeast um, that was you know that comes from the vineyard, and we only use about twenty percent. This this vintage we used twenty percent new oak. So our next wine, speaking of ageability, everyone knows that everything ages better in Yes. So this is you know generally you can have magnums much longer than standard sized bottles. Um, they'll continue to show just really, really well as so long as they're, again, stored properly. So this is the 2001, another really, really special bottling. I think this is a really cool one. So again, um, made, Jim made this as well. Did you want to say anything about um, this wine? Yeah, I can talk about production. But, so um, this is all made from Navarro Estate fruit. Uh, there's a little, plus some long-term contract from our neighbors uh, next door at Game Ranch. But um, of all the five blocks that went into this wine, uh, there's only one that remains that was fairly young. It was a Dijon clone. But everything else was sort of old uh, Wente clones and uh, on, on AXR. And so, you know, I we tended to pick you know, it, in that 23 and a half bricks route, we, you know, try to pick for acidity and the pH on the wine is still in the mid 3.3s. Um, yeah. And um, it's about 30% uh, new oak, but it's all in sort of, when they produce barrels often, um, they'll age the wood about three years, about two years for most Pinot Noir productions that we do. But we actually age the wood for barrel production an additional year. And we're using uh, exclusively Vosges oak, which is the coolest of the barrel producing regions. And so it's very tight grained and doesn't really impart, you know, the huge vanilla flavors that you normally would see. And it's really restrained oak. And we're only like a medium medium minus uh, toast on this. And so, um, you know, it has some, even to this day, I was surprised that there is some oak influence in it, but I think it's mostly expressed in giving some, some length uh, to the wine. And it also sat uh, on leaves uh, for about nine months before it was wrapped in the, in the bottle. That's incredible. I think the texture on this is just beautiful. Listen, in your work, how do you convince uh, collectors, consumers that Chardonnay is worth using, <coughs> even California Chardonnay? Because I, I know my career, I see a lot of people like, oh, do they write Burgundy? It's worth saving. No other white wine will age. So I think it's like making the connection, like Jim said, like the acidity and, you know, how, how do you make that case to people like, yeah, it's really, California Chardonnay is really worthy of laying down and giving some time to see where it goes. Do you find that people bring that up saying, you know, only Burgundy or are they more open to it now? I think they're a little bit more open to it. I think that opportunities like this where they can taste a 22 year old wine. Those types of opportunities are really something that as an industry we should be offering up um, because it's it's one thing to read a tasting note, you slap some dates on it, but it's really experiences like this that show, wow, this is a killer wine. You know, this is up there with some of the better burgundies that I've had that are even older than this. So um, I think that as an industry, as we should be holding some wines back to be offering them for TC events for trade and for consumers instead of just you know theorizing yes these wines are going to be great 20 years from now 15 years from now and the more that we can have people write about the an experience like this going yes these are 
this is a fantastic wine. This, you know, there's wines I've tasted that might be five years old um, that will have this kind of potential, but most people are drinking them, you know, upon release or, or not giving them too much time. So if we can encourage people, that's one of the things I'm super passionate about, drink the wines in your cellar, don't leave them until the end when someone else just has to um, go through them. Really taking the time to enjoy these and opening them up. If there's a question though, if you think that they're too old, maybe you're going to be pleasantly surprised that they are continuing to evolve and really just saying, I think this is in such a beautiful spot right now. But yeah, I think to your, your point, having experiences like this is the best way. We'll leave the court on that. I'm just curious because when I go back to yeah, well, I have two amazing pros help with all of that. I think overall um, they came out fairly easily. I think the Hanley was one of the mains, but I have a um, contraption called a Durand that's an also and a um, and a worm that work together. And they, they came out really well, right? Yeah, and I think this from, from a similar perspective, like just because the cork is crumbling indicates nothing about the wine inside. Like Absolutely. sometimes people are like, oh my god, there's a tiny speck of cork in my glass, the wine is ruined. And my response is always, you know, the cork and the wine have been friends for a real long time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it can be, I mean, a crumbling cork can be an indication of improper storage. It can be an indication of oxidation. It, it can indicate things, but it's not an absolute. So I just think in general, you know, having some good tools in your toolkit and learning, you know, learning how to open a longer cork that might be kind of fragile. But if worse comes to worse, you, you can always pour wine over cheesecloth. Like that's another thing people are like. The, I mean, the wine is sound. If, if that little bit of cork really bothers you, you know, most we've done that for sure. We're pouring wine over cheesecloth. So a, a crumbling cork does not indicate that the wine is flawed. Right. Great point. And there's um, there's several different things. What I'm doing you know, high-end dinners or anything like that. Always try to cans it if I'm, I always try to encourage a lot of my clients that are not drinking through their collections fast enough, you know, bring bottles in, pay corkage, tip heavily on them. Um, <laughs> but if you're bringing out a really special bottle, perhaps even testing it with a chloroven to make sure that it's sound before you bring it to the restaurant and open it, things like that. There's, there's definitely ways to check to see if the wine is sound before you open it, but then always having backup is a great idea. So, um, yeah, and the Durand, it used to be several hundred dollars when it first came out. Now it's down to like 150, and it's a great, great, great tool for older bottles. Um, there's one point I had to throw away over 300 cases of wine that I was having to move out of someone that had inherited them, and I put that thing to work. So. <laughs> All right, the first Pinot that we're going to be tasting is the Toulouse. The Toulouse is one of my all-time favorite. Do we have anyone from Toulouse here? That's a bummer because I'm only going to say really great things about them. <laughs> <laughs> we'll tell them later. <laughs> it was one of those wineries. I forget who told me about them. It could have been Ali Smith Story. Um, it's a longtime wine professional friend of mine. And I went to Toulouse and they do just uh, Alsatian varietals and all of their wines are just so pretty, so approachable. Um, great wine club. There's, I know there's a ton of wine clubs out there, but there was one of those ones where, it, you know, it, all of their wines went with all of the meals that we would prepare at home. So definitely encourage you to check them out if it's not a winery that you're familiar with. This is their 12, no, 13, Toulouse Goose Estate. I think they do like four to six different bottlings of Pinot Noir every year. Um, tiny little place up on the hill, but just again, really, really pretty, very, I would say, Alsatian style wine producing. I don't think that they use a lot of oak on their wines. All of them tend to be really low in alcohol and just really pure fruit. Some people that were at the tasting yesterday, we're probably going to be repeating some of those today, but the people that are producing wines from the Anderson Valley, even if they don't have wineries here, are really, really doing a fantastic job. 
So I'm excited for you guys to taste more of those as well, and hopefully consider you know, how these are showing as far as the ageability goes with you know, whether it's for personal consumption or restaurants, retailers. It's And they're also just an incredible buy. I think this is one of those places where if you can buy these wines early before they quadruple in price, it's a really good idea. Do we have any questions about the first few wines? And then our next is going to be the Hush Knoll. We have someone from Hush here. Would you like to um, have me Sure. Um, this is or introduce yourself <laughs> first. So, Grab Osteen with Hush Vineyards. Um, wine maker came on in 03. So Hush is a small, a three-acre little block. It was originally planted in 71 by Tony Hush, and um, our vineyard manager is still with us, Al White. Uh, there's a tale that rootstock went the ground in 68, and then slowly, but um, but 71 is the, is the date that we use. And so these vines are old, and they continue to produce um, really gripping wine. So it doesn't surprise me that this has some staying power. Yeah. Um, late 90s, I mean, this is on mm -hmm. ASR. It's, it's a little bit bigger. It's down the creek bit. We interplanted with the 667, Pijan 667 in there. And so in the first few years of that, we picked it in a couple of picks, and now we're basically even out of back to some of the pick day. 2010, uh, I know Tom was talking about early harvest is kind of the norm moving ahead, but 2010, I recall, was a, was a heavy year. There was lots of fruit out there and extremely long growing season. We didn't pick until the beginning of October, which is late, at least in my limited experience here. You know, normally it's, it's a February, you get started on first week, you know, on keynotes, but so amazingly long growing season, nice and slow and cool, hang time, if you will, and um, I'm happy that the wine is showing up. Yeah, does this have any whole cluster? It on? does, yeah, okay. fractional whole, you know, I never go anything about 33%, so it's probably 15 to 20%. Yeah, it's really, really well integrated. It doesn't have, kind of, it's kind of trendy for some people to be doing the whole cluster, but a lot of them do it when the stems are a little too green, and that's all I get are those piercing. So this is a really, I think, fantastic example of one that was made. Growing season for sure. Yeah. Definitely had a big yeah. time, right? Yeah. yeah. I would say compared to the Toulouse, I think the Toulouse is gorgeous. This one probably has another 20 years on it with these tannins and the acidity. So I think that this has still got a lot of life to live. It's a cool little vineyard block for sure. That's why it's still in the ground. Mm -hmm. And the knoll, is that just... It's a little section, about, again, about three acres down, right up from the Navarro River, back side of the property. Uh, yeah, it was our, it's the original Pinot Noir plant in the area. And then farming practices with you guys, they're all kind of on the sustainable, organic? Absolutely, fish friendly, sustainable, you know, we're not certified for you. Yeah. And same with Meyer family in Navarro, or we're all on the... I think that that's really important. That's something I'm, as a chef, incredibly passionate about. Organic sustainability. Start to get on the whole biodynamics, you know. We've been a no-till no -till vineyard since 1973. Yeah. I think it's also, I, I, I think it's really evident when you're driving up and down the valley that it is a lot more wild than you'd see in other manicured wine regions as well. And with all of the wildlife in here, and of course the cannabis industry is, is thriving in secret in some of the areas that everything's really working together to keep the environment as healthy and productive as possible. Hey, Melissa, I just want to make sure everybody heard that. So that vineyard is the oldest Pinot. The first Pinot vineyard planted in Utah, that's the first season. It's pretty cool. Quick question about, we were talking about the biodiversity versus the monoculture. How does that affect the, the grapes and the wines? That's a great question. I think one of the winemakers would be able to speak better to that. I, 
the biodiversity and how it affects the grapes and the vines versus more monoculture. <laughs> um, so yeah, we just let really whatever native grasses and plants and endemic species come in and you know grow between the vines. And um, there was a point in time, I think, in the early '70s when we were following suit with the way other people were doing things. And what we found after a few years was that when there's nothing to eat other than a grapevine, that's what the insects whose habitat you've destroyed by, by tilling under the vines, um, they'll come up and eat your grapevines. So, um, and there was a lot of uh, small insect called a thrip that, you know, when we would do that would come up into the grapevines and they would, you know, especially in the spring, the thrip feeding would really stunt the, the vine growth until it got, you know, warm enough that uh, the thrips died out and, you know, Sometimes other insects would come up. So um, we found that we actually had a healthier grapevines that were able to produce, you know, better leaf area and sweeter fruit just by not tilling. Um, and then there's the other situation of you want to have dynamic soil that has roots in it, has bacteria in it, and worms and all that other going on because it's this symbiotic relationship that really occurs in the in the root zone and uh, and a healthier grapevine is going to be going to have that much more flavor and you're going to really be have vines that are more expressive of of their environment i totally agree there's a great book by um kermit lynch adventures on the wine route i think there's one chapter in there where he had talked about um you know, he was walking along in, I think, in Burgundy, and they found the bees were there, and there was little like blackberries in this little water area. And he started putting together that he thought that perhaps it was like cross pollination that was bringing those essences into the wines. And a lot of people like to disregard that, but I would invite you to while you're up here, and this is gorgeous season. Of everything's just starting to bloom. Take a walk as much as you can and really, it sounds super hippie, but kind of be meditative about it because I have found and my extensive wine travels, if I take the time to go out there and I'm not one of those psalms you're gonna see grabbing hands full of dirt and <laughs> whatever. I mean, there's something to be said for that as well, but that's not my stuff. But I do, I look at the flowers. I remember I was in Sheenon once and there is um, all these wild irises. And I actually took a moment, I love irises. I, I took the time to smell them. And then that scent has stuck with me ever since. And I can totally identify particular Sheenons based on this iris essence that I would get. And when I'm teaching people about wine, I encourage them, especially in California, go to the farmer's markets and just taste everything in the season, grab handfuls of, you know, the rosemary that are out here and the lavender and then just the different flora and fauna because I do think that there is something to be said that you can find redwood essences in some of these wines if you spend time out there and really kind of do whatever you can to memorize that scent and that sensation. And I don't think that you find that in a lot of the manicured regions that it's everything looks beautiful but you're getting almost more like oak and other things that aren't speaking to place. Yes, I'll just really quickly say too that you know we still have about 20 acres of Cabernet in Napa and we have vineyards on three different sides of us that are separated by a dirt road. If one of our neighbors gets disease we're going to get the disease. It's just a matter of time. Um, and so you have to work really closely with your neighbors and there is a ton of disease pressure spread. Um, here, I, I really think that's mitigated by the natural corridors that separate most of the properties and that's why you see so many vineyards here that are, have been in the ground for so long. The disease pressure is really, really low here and so the biodiversity helps in that everything's eating everything because everything is here to eat everything. If there's, a, if there's a critter that can walk around and eat, it's here. We have the bears, 
and the mountain lions all the way down to the littlest things. We have foxes looking in the windows at night before they eat the rolled oats in the garden. So everything's eating everything here. The disease pressure is pretty low. And that results in transparency in the farm <clears throat> because there's nothing in there but grape juice. So this last one, covered in, in the cellar dust, the Hanley, this is the 1993. Was that 30 years? How is that possible? Um, <laughs> okay. But still really lovely. I would say this is the most interesting and um, as far as the how it's aging, I've had some Pinot, California Pinots from the 70s. I would say it tastes a little bit similar to this. Still think it's good, still think it's fresh. Um, but one of those things that I deal with, at least with consumers, is they don't have the opportunity to taste stage wine. So they might taste this and automatically think it's bad, where it's, it's just interesting. It's not a bad wine, there's no flaws in it. But it is a you know, 30 year old wine that, you know, possibly, probably wasn't made the age. And I think it's still showing really, really well. And again, doing tastings like this where we're just tasting the wines, we're not having it with food or anything else, you know, kind of think about how you would pair this, what situations that this would be best in um, to really complement the food and the wine. Yeah. And Hanley, no, we don't have anyone from Hanley here, we do? Oh, yay! Hi! Welcome! Do you um, want to speak on this wine? Yeah, I, I know actually not much about the wine, because I was seven when it was made. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we don't have that good of records going back, it's pretty digital. Um, so my parents, uh, my mom started the winery in 82. Um, my, they actually moved here because my dad came to work in the bar, um, in the cellar. And, um, and my mom was working in, uh, for Daguerre at Chateau St. Jean. And, um, after she had my sister, um, met Jed Steele of Edmeads in a play group that kids the same age. So then she, she started working at, at Edmeads. And her last vintage there was um, 82, and that was her first vintage for Hanley. Um, started in our basement. We didn't have um, any of our own fruit, but my grandfather had some dry creek fruit. And so her first wine was a North Coast Chardonnay. I wish I had one bottle of that left. So I wish I wish we could have shared that. Um, and uh, yeah, we didn't make it. so she plant she bought the property where we are now in '85 and planted the vineyard in '86. Um, and she wanted to be a sparkling wine house, so did plant Pinot and Chardonnay, but the Pinot was really geared towards sparkling wine. Um, we got some cuttings from Rotor. Her mom and Michelle were really good friends. Um, and it wasn't until 89 that we made a, a red Pinot. You know. um, so this is a 93. <clears throat> and yeah, we've been, I really like old wines, and so I've been digging through our cellar and opening things. Um, there's a lot of gaps, but we do have a really nice cellar. And uh, we opened this in November for um, a library wine dinner and just thought it was really pretty, definitely old. Um, <clears throat> and. But at that point, she definitely was not making these wines to age. Uh, I'm gonna see it again. Oh, um, and yeah, I do have a little info on it now. Okay, so. Yeah, so it's actually 13 and a half percent alcohol, which I find was surprising at that time. Um, and this would have been coming from it's Anderson Valley. I don't know what vineyard is, but um, yeah, it's mostly from our own estate, and then another vineyard in it says small vineyard near Philo. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, that's really all. I think anyone has any questions, but um, I just wanted to be able to share a much older wine. I think it's. I really appreciate you guys putting this on. It's really interesting to get to. Thank you so much for finding it for us. I will say 93 was a really late, cool vintage. And I think, and you can just taste it. It's like we barely were able to get fruit right. And that, you know, the lightness of this vintage, you know, a lot of times we didn't, 92 is a pretty big blockbuster black fruit driven vintage. And 
This night, you know, we, I always like the 93 vintage a lot. It's just in its light, lighter color, more strawberry, red fruit ribbon. And to yes. see, to have this wine now is really special. And it's just, it just really is showing fantastic. And it just, you know, it's just lighter. You don't have to have these big black, you know, blackberry, black fruit driven wines to be great. This, this wine really carried it, you know, it being a lighter style and a lighter edge. It's really fantastic. One of the beautiful things about it is that the structure, the palate, the texture, all that stuff is completely intact. Only the fruit has turned the volume down a little bit. But everything else about wine that we love is still vivid and fresh in this one. Absolutely. Yeah, so our harvest dates for that were it was September 30th through October 9th. And yeah, I remember to Jim's point about late harvest, I remember as a kid it would be like Halloween was coming and the rains were coming and my mom was finally picking the Chardonnay because it wasn't going to get any riper, but it, it, that was when we needed to pick it. Um, so it, often late October would be our, our end of harvest. Um, and now, yeah, mid-September, I mean, October is sort of late for us to be ready. So our final wine. Does everybody have the late harvest boards in their glass? It's a 2007 hush. So this is one of my biggest uh, issues with a lot of collectors. Everybody collects dessert wine, ports, and Cabernet, and almost nobody drinks them. So I'm trying to find reasons for them to open up bottles during the pandemic. I wrote a whole blog post on um, reasons to open up the Cabernet and, and just simple dishes because I do deal with a lot of end of life scenarios where we're stuck with you know a ton of cameras that have never been opened and, and enjoyed and um, I really want to push people to open up these special bottles on a more regular occasion. It could be you know a Tuesday night with in out burgers and a good ball of cap. Um, but the dessert wines I think that that is one this is a delicious wine. No, I don't think anyone in the room is going to argue how delicious this yes. is. So that's one of the reasons that wineries are able to sell so many great dessert wines, because who would not want to take this home? The thing is, we need to get people to open them and drink them. So um, if anyone has any thoughts on that, yes, Barbara. Um, I was talking in the back, and I uh, missed the line. What is the line? This is the... Yes, thank you. This isn't on the tasting sheet because I screwed up. 2007 Hush Late Harvest Wurtz Trainer. Oh, okay. So you'll have to write that one in. Um, I mean, this is obviously great with cheese. It'd be great with foie gras. I don't know if anybody's cooking foie gras at home besides. Invite me over. Always have a lobe in the freezer. Um, but definitely, if you can find reasons and excuses and the recipes to you know pair with these incredible dessert wines that are just sitting in people's wine collections at home I think that that's a really interesting thing to explore um, and can I have you speak on this uh, wine sure but, you know, bacon wrapped melon sounds pretty good to me yeah, yeah, it does sound great yeah. let's see um, <laughs> yeah so 2007 was a great growing season for sure for everything I think except for late harvest wines, because we didn't get a ton of the try this year. Okay. It was um, maybe 20, 25% or something. It wasn't like one of those years that's just an epic late harvest year. So this is the first year that we actually cut the canes on the Gewurz to help to make it happen? sweeten things up. Yeah, to desiccate uh, past cerealage or whatever it's called. And um, the first time we tried it, and we kind of keep that in our toolbox. If we've already dedicated a certain segment of the vineyard to build a harvest, we pick everything else. Yet we don't get what we want from a weather or a rot standpoint. We'll, we'll use that. And so we, back to your picking dates. Nowadays, our late harvest comes in normally around Halloween. You know, this was a late late harvest. It wasn't picked until like the second week in November. So. Um, Again, light botrytis, uh, not crazy sweet, but I think we did a good job just balancing sugar and acidity and showing up. Great. Yeah, this is gorgeous. I, one of the things I was curious about, um, 
you know, we have our other wine region where they're making wines that are so big and so much oak and so much fruit, and so much alcohol, that they're not making approachable wines. So I think that's one of the things I love about Anderson Valley is so much of the wines are really fresh, really approachable, younger, but they're also showing that they are aging really, really beautiful, beautifully um, without going over the top with any of the production level and that the fruit is all sound and as long as they're stored properly, again, like I said, the biggest investment to make in wine collecting is going to be storage up front. Um, so I, I, it's one of the reasons this is, that this is truly, truly one of my favorite wine regions in the world. It's gorgeous, the wines are amazing. As you're gonna see throughout the rest of the week, you know, River Estate, Scharfenberger, you know, like in the new kid on the block ish, you know, in the grand scheme of things. Um, everybody is just making such beautiful, thoughtful lines that I think if you can spend any free time that you have, even if you're blasting your heater and driving with your windows down on the way back, just get, <laughs> get as much, you know, of that of that air into your car and really yeah, this it's a trek to get out here. There's, even though we live two and a quarter hours away, you know, it's it's a place that you're gonna want to spend the night. You're not gonna want to come up and go tasting all day and then drive home. So really, take the opportunity while you're here. I encourage you to do as much as you can to really absorb your surroundings and whenever you open a bottle of the Anderson Valley wines. Try to put yourself back in this place and this experience that you're here because I think this is really, really, truly special. Thank you all. Do you have any questions? Please.